For nearly two years, I've been hard at work on a world-building project with unique locations, characters, and even its own language. This is Aegis, the home of this universe, and today we're traveling to Mekdal, in the southern region of the Corsaki Empire. I'll show you how I turned this old train toy into a sci-fi postal stop, and the story at the end will reveal the link to the rest of my world. This is Gimme Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. While helping a friend with some housework last month, I stumbled upon a bin of toy trains. They weren't getting a whole lot of love out in the elements, but the fine details and interesting scale had my wheels spinning. And after asking about them, I was gifted the entire set, on one condition, that I turn it into something cool for the channel. As it turns out, I had been looking at doing a structure for my next build, and I thought that the interesting shapes and textures on these toy trains would lend themselves perfectly to just this. It's worth noting that there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into these concept sketches, as you can see from the thumbnail sketches in these notebooks. In fact, there's an enormous amount of planning, reference gathering, and material scouting that happens long before I ever tap that little red button on the camera. There was a lot to work with here, like the tiny protruding rivets, the wooden slats, and various hinges and latches, but of course, to make these work in an entirely new context, the scale couldn't change too much. This is one of the biggest challenges I've found in making these dioramas. The broader my source of materials, the harder it is to maintain a consistent scale. This means that for many of my Beyond the Blight models, the materials dictate the scale, and each project is different. As I've mentioned before, this concept art phase, though tedious, is extremely helpful as I'm forced to slow down and analyze every potential piece that will need to be built. A lot of brainstorming is happening as these strokes go down on the paper, and I'm thinking not just about how to make these objects, but the order I'll need to assemble them in. Color is another consideration, although I'm not too strict with myself about adhering to the original concept art when I begin painting the model. For me, concept art is about experimentation, and establishing a general palette or mood for the final piece. You might be wondering why a postal service would even exist in a futuristic world like Aegis. With the advent of digital technology, what purpose would physical letters serve? And since delivery robots exist in this world, couldn't people simply hire them to take packages directly to the recipient? My explanation is a bit philosophical, but bear with me. Human sentiment toward technology is a constantly swinging pendulum. When the tech is new, it's exciting and alluring and people can't get enough. But eventually it becomes commonplace and we begin to notice the downsides. What was once novel becomes mundane and what was old-fashioned becomes nostalgic. The inhabitants of Aegis are people too, and so a demand has surged for transporting physical letters and handwritten notes. But there are other practical considerations too. Some people simply don't trust sending digital correspondence, which must travel through the Satlink, an AI-powered satellite network controlled by the Corsaki Royals, the largest ruling family on the planet. Besides, Picking up your mail from the local post office has become a pastime in many regions. It's a place to exchange stories and bits of news with other customers as you wait in line, or perhaps check for local jobs and gigs that are often listed on bulletins pinned to the walls of the office. After constructing the main office from one of the train's boxcars and adding wood grain texture with an X-Acto blade, I added some shelves, one at the front window and another at the side of the booth. This side shelf was inspired by this tiny vertical slot, which of course was perfect as an envelope chute. After taking some measurements with my handy Hardell digital calipers, I trimmed down a bunch of coffee stirrers and superglued them to the walls.
using tongue depressors, I also built this wooden cubby space, which would be used for envelope sorting behind the counter. For the two trusses used to support the building's roof, I cut out a bunch of slanted slats from styrene, using this template I designed as a guide. Once the pieces were scored and snapped out, I added rivets by indenting the reverse side with a sharp filing tool. I then glued the slats onto 5mm PVC tubes. I had originally planned to make these trusses four-sided columns, but I ran out of plastic tubing. Fortunately though, I did have this square acrylic rod of the same diameter, so I was able to at least create the two trusses needed to keep the roof up. As this channel's viewership has steadily grown, I've gotten a lot more questions asking for guidance in creating projects along with inquiries about world building, writing, and video creation. Truth be told, running a one-man YouTube channel requires a plethora of skills. A lot of that learning can be done right here on YouTube, and I'm a big proponent of a learn-as-you-go methodology. However, I found that there's enormous value in curated learning experiences, which is why I was excited to try out Skillshare's platform when they reached out to me last month. I've really enjoyed sampling Skillshare's huge catalog of courses on topics like video editing, graphic design, storytelling, and voice acting. Unlike YouTube, teachers must be approved by the Skillshare team before uploading courses. This means that the advice is coming from instructors with practical and current experience in their fields. Courses are also organized into learning paths for a range of skill levels, with sequential lessons that build on one another. I've especially enjoyed MKBHD's course on YouTube shooting, editing, and scripting, and Christopher Tester's course on voice acting. If you'd like to sample these courses for yourself, you can do so for a whole month completely free by being one of the first 500 people to click the link in the video description. After constructing the roof's frame with popsicle sticks and chipboard, I was eager to try out these tiny ceramic shingles. The last time I did curved shingles was for my Sky Market build, and I definitely preferred the more realistic and textured look of these. I'm still finding that sweet spot between buying finished materials and building things from scratch, but ultimately I find myself making decisions based on how much time I want to spend on a given element and if I'm in the mood for the painstaking process of scratch building. Since each build already takes me weeks to complete, every decision is a trade-off. In the original concept, I included a crawl space that would be used for package and equipment storage. That space was based off this gondola, the official jargon for open-topped train cars. A lot of modification was required here, including shearing off a sizable segment of the thing and then carefully adding windows with my rotary tool. This is a really scary thing to do, not for the risk of injury, which is low given the sanding disc I'm using, but because it's so easy to stray from the desired cut and ruin the model. I recommend practicing a lot on spare plastic and wood before attempting this on any crucial pieces. With the windows cut, I hid these gnarled edges with popsicle sticks and did the same with the gaps at the bottom. I also liberated the other end of the gondola into this flat piece, which I wanted to serve as some sort of robotic hinged door. The idea here is that the handling of packages is done mostly by machines. Drones come and go with packages on the structure's roof, and telescoping robot arms are constantly sorting and stowing the packages in the crawl space. For that rooftop landing pad, I designed and laser cut this template from 1mm chipboard, mounted it with PVA glue to a piece of wood, then, quite painstakingly, bent this 1mm aluminum armature wire into a perimeter roof rail based on a custom template I designed and printed on paper. Tiny brackets were slid onto this rail, and these were then used to affix the rail to the edge of the roof. This was one of those things that had no right coming out as good as it did since there was a lot of eyeballing going on here rather than precise measuring and planning, but I was pretty darn pleased with the results. The final roof element was the field goal-esque binary antenna, which helps to orient some of the older drone models for a more precise landing. I opted to use a 2mm acrylic rod for this rather than metal, which would be lighter, easier to glue, and impossible to accidentally bend out of shape later. 
It was also at this point that I dug into my electronics bin and fished out some wiring and this LED filament. There wasn't a whole lot of point in designing a building's interior without sufficient lighting, so I suspended the filament in this acrylic tubing, wired it all up, and attached. For the stone pedestal beneath the structure, it was a pretty straightforward process of scoring the XPS foam with a blunted pencil tip. Everything was then given a rocky texture with some crumpled foil. You could spend a lot more time on something like this for added realism, but since this wasn't going to be a focal point, I was okay moving quickly through this part of the process. Next, this cheap, kitschy frame from my local dollar store made for a perfect base, though some odds and ends needed to be glued inside to make the uneven XPS foam flush with the edges. I often wonder what my local dollar store employees think about my shopping habits. Heavy on the superglue and duct tape, obsessed with ugly decorative frames, and with inordinate amounts of time spent poring over children's toys held just inches from my face as I inspect the greebly potential. I kind of suspect that this is all culminating in a confrontation that will end with me covering my face and fleeing the scene screaming, don't look at me, don't look at me, I'm just a YouTuber, like the elephant man. After carving in the stone details for the area around the pedestal, I filled in some of the gaps and unwanted texture with epoxy sculpt softened with a bit of water. Larger scale models like this always look best with plenty of accessories, so it was time to get cracking on the techno clutter, like this utility pole, made from the thigh section of a Gundam model, ATST parts, plastic tubing, heat shrink tubing, and a whole bunch of other odds and ends. For the wooden platform, I built a frame from square pine dowels, then covered the frame in wood planks made of popsicle sticks. One of the reasons I've spent so much time creating an original language for this world is that I wanted signage and logos that weren't just in English or in an alphabet representing English words. The characters here read Jawama Kenta, meaning literally long distance carry, or more colloquially, logistics. One thing I was really excited about for this build was the creative contribution of some of my patrons who helped model the pipes, hardware, and shipping containers featured in this build. Thank you guys so much for your submissions. Some items were also contributed by James over at Rebel Base Builds, who is one of the most talented 3D modelers I've come across here on YouTube. His immaculate models are available to his patrons for free or can be purchased on his Etsy page. I also designed and printed these tiny cardboard boxes with the official Corsecchi iconography. I was a little annoyed that I'd measured them improperly though, leaving top flaps that were a tad too short for full coverage. But after a bit of creative tape placement, I was able to salvage my efforts. The very last piece of this scene was a delivery drone. Keen Star Wars fans will no doubt identify the ATST foot I used at the top of the drone, and most of the other bits are either from that same model or random Gundam models with gaps covered in styrene. I really didn't spend too much time on this, but I liked the end result, which resembled a tiny fighter ship and reminded me of how badly I need to actually build a ship for my Beyond the Blight universe. With all the dozens of odds and ends assembled, it was on to painting. But before we dive into the short story, I'm thrilled to announce the arrival of these brand new Beyond the Blight shirts. If super cool t-shirts aren't your thing though, I've got these designs also on vinyl stickers. So hop on over to gamebuilds.com while supplies last. Dunn Riggs didn't mind the line. It was a chance to get himself out of the dingy apartment that was beginning to reek of mold and the faint but unmistakable tinge of rodent droppings. Metna would have had a fit if she could see the place now. Her neat row of potted herbs and flowers on the kitchen windowsill had withered away to skeletal remains. Once spotless windows and vents were now choked with dust and cobwebs, Every surface was littered with grease-caked bolts and rusty panels, 
the remnants of dissembled modules and emitters from Dunn's endless tinkering. Metna's delicate touch had made their house a home. Without her in it, it could hardly be called anything more than a dirty little box, and Dunn Riggs expected that one morning soon would be his last, and the dirty box would become a coffin. Their coffin. Metna's final days had been spent in that apartment too, after all, battling a persistent bout of pneumonia and losing. Dunn thought it so strange how time had seemed to simultaneously slow down and speed up with his wife's passing. Each day was an eternity without her lilting voice, singing old Corsecchi marching tunes in their tiny kitchen as she baked oysters, or cursing under her breath at the landlady's maintenance automeca as it came knocking, demanding to inspect the air scrubbers or spore alarms. She didn't think Dunn could hear her, but he did, chuckling and smiling to himself every time. He missed her. No, that wasn't right at all. He ached for her. The bed was hopelessly cold without her beside him, the echoes too deep, the smells and sounds all wrong. Picking up? croaked a voice from over his shoulder. Dunn turned to find a wiry man almost as old as himself standing beside him in a dusty yellow coat. Hands shoved deep into his pockets as he rocked back and forth on the mud cake soles of old boots. A small parcel was tucked under one arm. Fudesh, Dunn said, addressing his neighbor by the first name. No pickups, just here for an inquiry. Oh? asked the wiry man, his nose twitching, catching the scent of a scintillating story he wasn't entitled to. He waited eagerly like a small dog hoping for dropped crumbs. It's probably nothing, Dunn said, shrugging casually. Well, maybe I can assist. These ears may be old, but they pick up a lot of chatter, Faresh said. Dunn bet they did. It's really nothing. Just an odd thing that happened with a delivery unit. I figured the post workers might know something about it. Fresh leaned forward on the balls of his feet, his eyebrows pushed up so high that Dunn thought they might force his hairline to retreat another few centimeters. Delivery unit, eh? Well, what'd you see? You'll think I'm crazy, Dunn said, testing the waters. Whole world's gone crazy, Dunn. Nothing could surprise this old badger. Dunn smiled back politely, but thought that the smaller man was grossly overestimating his worldliness. He was no scientist or intellectual, had to Dunn's knowledge never traveled beyond the borders of Mechadal, and as such had little exposures to the wonders of the wider world. He was a simple greasehead, a dock worker who kept the ship's engines running and ran loading cranes when hands were short. But unlike the sailors, he'd never set foot on the open seas. You've been to the southern gate just beyond our complex recently? Sure, nothing but abandoned machining shops and mecha maintenance sheds. Uh, working on mechas is bad business these days, you should know. Yes. Well, I was out there a few days ago. Way out there? <laughs> what, you get lost? Faresh said, snickering at his own joke. Dunn shrugged. He didn't bother telling the man that it had been a favorite spot of Metna's. They liked to hike out past the southern gate in the fall, when the air was cool and crisp. Somehow, sharing this information felt like a betrayal. A secret shared lost its sheen. Dunn had been back to the spot to dig a small hole at the base of a pine tree they'd once picnicked under and had quietly buried her ashes there. Just needed some fresh air. Apartment living, you know? Sure, sure, Fresh said. So, as I exit the gate and pass one of these boarded up maintenance sheds, 
I see a man inside. Uh, just the outline, you understand. A tall man in a heavy dark coat. His hood covering his head. It's so dark inside that I'm just catching glances of him through the broken windows. I almost thought I was imagining it at first, but I stop and stare and listen. And sure enough, it is a man. Eh, probably just a drifter, hoping to find some abandoned tools and pawn them. I thought the same thing until I saw his face. The roof was caved in in one of the rooms, and he steps right into the light. And I see it's no man at all. Faresh was leaning so far forward that Dunn thought he might have to catch him if he tumbled into his arms. It was a delivery automeca. Corsecchi insignia and everything. Bright yellow paint job, but all covered up by his coat. And it was clearly looking for something. Well, that is unusual, Faresh said. Did you speak to it? Not at first. It was such a strange thing to me, the way it moved among old crates and shelves. It didn't look like a mecha unit at all. Something just felt wrong about the whole thing, you know? Fresh nodded slowly, fully engrossed in the story now. I was almost feeling a little nervous. I guess I was thinking that if that thing was not supposed to be there doing whatever it was doing, then I certainly wasn't supposed to be there watching it. Automechas are much stronger than a human, even the civilian models. I know all about it, Faresh said, putting a hand up in a solemn gesture. Seen one get jumped by two drunks on the docks one night. They both ended up paralyzed from the waist down. Who knows what those boys were thinking? Now go on. Well, I tried to sneak away, not wanting it to see me, but then it did. It heard me, or sensed me somehow, and it looked up at me. What did it do? Fresh asked eagerly. It spoke, but not in one of those Atomeka voices. It was a human voice. The expression on Fresh's face shifted from one of intense interest to irritation. Ah, he said, swatting the air dismissively. You're teasing me. I, I am not, Dunn stammered, surprised by the sudden vitriol in the man's voice. You've had your fun. I won't bother you any further, Fresh said, stuffing his hands back into his coat pockets and turning away from the man. Dunn turned back to the line quietly and shrugged. He didn't mind waiting in silence. Thank you all so much for watching. My next project is going to be a junk bot for the Big Bot Bash Challenge being hosted by Bill Making Stuff. A lot of model makers here on YouTube are also joining in, and if you'd like to get involved, check out my Patreon page for a public post all about the challenge. Until then, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.